Oh, there was really, really no choice. My dad was an attorney. He, I think he knew he would not have a long life. Uh, he was a solo practitioner. He would take me uh, to his trials uh, in Northern California in these little towns because he was lonely. I'd say, oh, I have a geometry test. He said, I'll teach you whatever you need to know. So I probably saw 10 trials before I was out of high school and took notes at the council table and worked late in his office typing documents. So it was, it was, so it was, it was not a question, would you be a doctor or a lawyer? Uh, or, or a priest, uh, it was just assumed. In a way, I was a little ahead of the curve because of my experience with, with my father and being basically a, a law clerk in, in his chamber, so I was a little ahead of the curve in that respect. I think it's a mistake to go on the appellate bench too young, uh, and I might have been too young because I, it's very important that you bring to each case a new energy, uh, a new commitment, because what you do is very important to the litigants. And so you have to be, so I was very careful to watch myself for the signs of burnout or, or, or disinterest. And so I've, I've always taught and I continued to teach, which I, I, I thought was important to do. But uh, as I said, I wanted to be a trial judge. Uh, Watergate. Uh, had come along, they weren't making new trial judges, and there was an opening on the Court of Appeals. And then Governor Reagan asked if I would like to be considered for that, and I thought, well, you know, the merry-go-round goes around and there's an empty horse. If you don't get on it, the next time it goes around, somebody's on the horse. So I thought maybe uh, I, I should take this opportunity. There's always, of course, a, a learning a learning curve uh, in any occupation you do, in, in any new project you undertake. Uh, so of course there was. And it was a more introspective occupation than I had thought. You have to ask yourself, what is it that's making me do this? Why am I deciding this? And it's surprising how often you have to go back to square one and say, you know, all of us have an instinct of judgment that we make. You, you meet a person, you say, I, I trust this person, I don't trust this person, I, I find her interesting, I don't find him interesting, whatever. You make these quick judgments. Uh, that's the way you get through life. And judges do the same thing. Um, and I suppose there's nothing wrong with that if it's just a beginning point. But after you make a judgment, you then must formulate the reason for your judgment into a verbal phrase, into a verbal formula. And then you have to see if that makes sense, if it's logical, if it's fair, if it accords with the law, if it accords with the Constitution, if it accords with your own sense of ethics and morality. And if at any point along this process you think you're wrong, you have to go back and do it all over again. And that's, I think, not unique to the law in that any prudent person behaves that way. I tell law students that we're not, like some law professors say, teaching you how to think, that sounds a little bit pretentious. Law professors say, oh, we teach you how to think, as if nobody else does. But of course, all good teachers, um, all good citizens uh, are interested in thinking. It is true that in the law, we teach you to think about very ordinary things in a very formal way. And I had to realize that. The other thing I had to learn was this. Lawyers, judges, law professors, talk all the time about stare decisis. If we want to say something important, we use Latin, because then it makes it sound more important. Uh, stare decisis means that you're bound by what previous judges have decided. Uh, unless it's very wrong and very important, and then you have to depart from that precedent, and that's a, a, a major event in the law. But essentially, you're bound by stare decisis. When I went on the court, I thought, well, this is not very interesting. Uh, it's, a, it's antiquarian, it's like historical research. I thought I'd be 
like a scientist putting together an explanation for an experiment that had failed, and I'd go back and say, well, you did this wrong, you didn't. And I was interested in it because I loved the law. Uh, but I thought it was rather limiting. Uh, I was quite mistaken. Really, the dynamic of being bound by precedent, the so-called stare decisis, is very forward-looking because it teaches you that you will be bound by what you do. You are the first person that would be bound by what you do. Uh, and if you're on an, uh, a court which reviews other courts, they will all be bound by what you do. So there is a, a really a very forward-looking dynamic to judging. You must ask yourself to the extent that you can, without being imprecise, how will my judgment play out in the future? And there's a lot of looking out the window <laughs> in that job. I, I was in Thailand right after the tsunami. A judges conference had been scheduled. And I thought, gee, should we be having a judges conference uh, in the wake of this terrible human tragedy? And uh, the State Department, Secretary Powell was still the Secretary of State, called and said, this is very important. You have to go to Thailand for this judges conference because they're talking about what it is to build a society and you build a society with a legal system. Law is part of the capital infrastructure. We can talk about that later if you want, but going back to Thailand. Uh, so we went to Bangkok, I think it was three and a half weeks after the tsunami. It was 400 miles from where the tragedy had occurred, and the Buddhist people uh, are very quiet and introspective themselves and didn't want to talk much about the specific tragedy. But I talked there with a priest who'd been working with the victims of the tsunami, and he used the method pioneered by the psychologist Robert Coles. Uh, who would talk to little children and he'd give them a blank sheet of paper and some crayons and ask the child to draw while they were talking as if in this interview you were asking me to draw something. And uh, he, would, he, he worked with 10 and 12 year old, 13 year old kids who'd lost everything, their brothers, their sisters, their parents, their homes. And he gave that kid four pieces of paper. And the first he said, draw what your life was, your parents, your brothers, your sisters, your house. And the second was draw this tsunami because you have to confront evil and the forces of nature which have injured you and somehow come to grips with it. You, you can't repress this. So draw the tsunami, draw the event. And the fourth paper, of course, was draw what your life wanted, what you'd like your life to be. But the third paper was the hardest, and that's draw the present. Draw the present. These kids had a particularly difficult problem in drawing the present because it was a completely changed uh, environment uh, that they had to adjust to. But it occurred to me that maybe it's the hardest for all of us to draw the present. Uh, we probably make a mistake when we predict the future, but at least we're confident that we know what it ought to be like, what we want it to be like. Um, and judges have to understand um, that they have to, in part, deal with the present, and that's almost harder. I can look back and know what the law was. I can look forward and say at least what I think it ought to be. Um, but you're, you must be careful you're not missing something. Your history is moving very quickly, and we're moving with it, and it's hard for us to assess whether or not we're taking the right direction. I, I don't think our society as a whole does uh, a very good job, frankly, of, of asking where they're headed. I haven't thought much about that question. Um, in part, we're so busy working on the next case, we can't worry about the last one. Uh, as I say again, you must be very confident uh, that you're not deciding one way or the other because of popular uh, opinion. The dynamic of the law is that it, trends, it transcends or attempts to transcend 
the emotions of the time. That's the dynamic of the legal system. The uh, most law professors and many commentators say that the judicial review, the, the idea that courts can set aside legislation, is anti-majoritarian or contra-majoritarian, so that a majority can't make its will binding on an injured minority. Uh, that's true in one sense, false in another. Uh, it may be true that when we set aside a particular congressional enactment or state law, which is an awful function, awful in the sense of powerful, um, it's true that we, for the moment, may displease the majority. But if you look over time, if you, if you uh, ask what the American people and a majority of the American people want over time, over our history, they want judicial review. They want to make sure that the promises of the Constitution are honored, that the commitments we made uh, basically over time with, the, uh, with our ancestors are followed. And uh, the Constitution defines the American people. You know, it's very odd. Uh, not odd, perhaps, but it's certainly interesting. Americans have their self-definition, their self-identity, shaped by the Constitution. When, when we, I thought I might tell those people today, I only have a few minutes. When we rebelled against England, the rest of the world said, what do these Americans want? What, what's the problem? And the Americans said, we want freedom. And the people in England and Europe said, freedom? Those are the freest people in the world on the other side of the Atlantic. They have all the property they need, all the land. They can pay taxes when they want and don't. What are they talking about, freedom? So then we had to send a fax back to them, <laughs> um, an email, uh, as, as to what, what our uh, principles were, what the reason for this revolt was, what the reason was that we were committing our, our young people uh, to confront the might of the British military. And the reason we gave was a legal one. The Declaration of Independence is basically an indictment of King George. And the Constitution is a formulation of what we think the principles of freedom are. And that's what defines America. We're so fortunate. And uh, uh, either by accident or history or providence or design, I think all, all of those. Uh, the the self-definition, the self-image of an American relates to his or her constitution. No other country in the world has that. Uh, we can't be smug about this and say no other country in the world can have a constitution. But this accounts for the fact that our constitution is the oldest constitution in the world. I've, I've had the heads of foreign governments ask me, oh, well now, I, I think I should amend the constitution to do this and that usually something that helps them over the short term. And I say, you know, a constitution by definition is something that has to last over time. Uh, Madison said a constitution must acquire the reverence of its people and it can only acquire that, that, that reverence uh, over time. And so the, the, the court wants to, is, is a way, it's one way of reminding Americans, of reminding ourselves that the Constitution must transcend the emotions and the opinions of a particular day. And so criticism doesn't bother me. I think criticism is very important. I, the Constitution doesn't belong to a bunch of judges and lawyers, it belongs to you, it's yours. Now, we have to interpret it in this formal way, but you have to live it. So if there is a decision the court doesn't like, of course, the press should write about it. I, I think it's unfortunate that sometimes they ascribe improper motives to judges and they don't understand the tradition. And, and a lot of editorial writers uh, just read the dissent, they don't read the majority. <laughs> um, the press does a fair job of reporting what we do, not a particularly good job of reporting why we do it, but that's, again, because of the timeline. Uh, they had to get a 24-hour, 48-hour deadline, and then the public loses interest. And our function, as I've tried to indicate, is uh, somewhat more philosophical uh, and has a somewhat broader timeline than that.
Sometimes people think compromise means squishy, centrist. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't. Uh, the whole idea of a democratic society is that there must be a consensus, and it's a consensus that should be based on rational dialogue. I'm not sure that mass politics in, uh, with modern communications has yet found a way to have a quiet, rational dialogue. I'm not quite sure we found the key to that. But um, we not only have to do that in our own society, we must not become a hostile, factious, divisive society. We must be a society that has a broad consensus on certain very fundamental values. And we must do that because after we build bridges of understanding with ourselves, we have to build bridges of understanding with the rest of the world. I was talking to some students uh, around the turn of the century. Uh, I guess I would be 1999, I think. And some student raised his hand and said, what are the great issues of the next millennium or the next 100 years? It was something I should have had an answer for after dinner table conversation or something. And, uh, and, and reflection, I didn't, it caught me by surprise. So I came up with an answer, I said, we have the, the great challenge and the first duty to build bridges of understanding with the world of Islam. And uh, I got more letters from that uh, comment, it was on C-SPAN, uh, than anything I've ever said. Thousands of letters saying, why isn't people saying that? And, uh, and it, it struck me that there's a void there. We're, we're in a, a struggle in which our security will depend on ideas. The idea of freedom, if accepted by most of the rest of the world, is our best security. And we must build bridges of understanding to explain the principles of freedom. And I'm not sure that we're doing a very good job at the moment. The easiest are the technical ones. The, stat the things I was trained to do in law school, how to read a statute, uh, how to uh, apply the rules of evidence. I have a lot of help in the history of the law for that. The most difficult ones are defining the components of human liberty because if you insist that the individual has a particular right, that means the legislature cannot infringe on that right. And sometimes um, your own values and your own morals um, really would disapprove of the conduct that you're ratifying, but you do so because there's an area of morality, but morality really should have an underpinning of rational choice, and each citizen must make a rational choice to determine what is good and what is, what is evil. And those, those are hard. You have to do it again every case. Uh, I thought, oh, I'm a good judge now, I, I know how to do that, and then I'll get a case, and I have to do it all over again. What is it that really should control the decision? What is it that's controlling my decision, and, and do those two match? And, and, and you, and, and you but judges, particularly on our court, uh, don't go around giving press conferences. We don't uh, have a press conference saying how great our decision yesterday was, or uh, how bad the dissent was, or something. Um, part of the reason for that is that we try to teach a lesson. We try to teach that we will listen to your cause and judge the cause only when we hear it. You know, we in any given year, prescinding, precluding foreign affairs perhaps, may make more important decisions than the legislative branch does. 
important in the sense that it will control the direction of society. Uh, that's not, be uh, in fact, uh, this is what June 3rd and by June 15th, all of our dissents and, and opinions must be circulated internally. And by June 30, we will finish our work for the year. Um, 80, 90, 100 cases. And that doesn't mean we're better than the Congress or more committed or more principled. It just means we're different. All we can do is decide. Uh, a case is presented to us and it's our duty and obligation to decide it whether we want to or not. And we decide it within the language of the law and the language of the law is different than the languages of the political branches. Not better, not worse, different. It's more confined. The language of the law has a, a grammar, a logic, a tradition, a dynamic, an elegance, a syntax that's all of its own. It's the language of the law. It's very formal. Um, and we decide we are constrained by that language of the law. We can decide only within the confines of that language. Other branches of the government providentially um, for, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and happily have a different language. And the job of the citizen is to uh, translate, and the job of the lawyer is to translate the language of the law to the language of everyday life. I didn't really think about it that much, no. I, uh, being a, a judge on the Supreme Court is kind of being like struck by lightning. I mean, the, the, the vacancies come up so rarely, and the stars have to be aligned the right way. I, I, uh, I know there are some judges who always think that they were going to be on the Supreme Court. One of the great judges in New York City, a learned hand, a uh, brilliant man, a very principled judge, a judge whose decisions can still teach you things when you read them, was a marvelous judge. He was a United States District Judge and the United States Court of Appeals. And everybody just assumed he would be on the Supreme Court. He had, he had the brilliance and the talent, uh, and, and he, he never was. Never was. Yes. And, and if you don't, if you have complete confidence that you're right, then you'd better do a reality check. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think the, uh, and, and there's a difference between being weak and indecisive um, and uh, and, 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 and not knowing at once what you're going to do. There's a, there's a difference because, as I've tried to indicate, uh, you have the duty of, of introspection and reflection and study and, and, of, of, um, and of judging, of adjudicating, based on what you hear. And I, I, I think you have a duty to keep an open mind. Then that's not indecisiveness. That's not indecisiveness. That's just a commitment to the tradition of the law. So of course, uh, you wonder, do you, have you missed things? In a sense, this is kind of a legal thing. Uh, on the Court of Appeals, it's a bit harder because you're the first appellate court and you have to make sure that the issue that you're talking about was what the trial judge's decision to turn on and that the attorneys have given you all the law. And on the Court of Appeals, I said, oh, I used to say, there must be something on this that the attorneys have missed that I have to find for myself. Uh, we don't have that problem really on the Supreme Court because we're a second or third tier review and the, the issue has been refined. Different courts have actually disagreed, which was when we really enter the, enter the fray. And so um, on the Supreme Court, it's actually easier in a sense to identify the issue you're supposed to decide how to go about deciding it and what the result should be is more difficult because you can't make a mistake uh, without really hurting the system. On the Court of Appeals, you could trim your sails a little bit. What's the metaphor? I heard a law professor one time say, when you go to a swimming pool with your towel and nobody's there, uh, you have your towel over here on this chaise lounge and you put other stuff, you make a big space. But then as more people come, you have to 
uh, you had to uh, uh, n uh, narrow your perim perimeter. Uh, you have to pull in. And uh, this is what happens in the law. You, if you're riding on a new area, uh, you, can take a, you can be expansive. If you're riding in a very difficult area, you must pay attention to what's around you. There was, uh, since I'd been an appellate judge and was committed to the law, I thought, uh, and, and since I taught the, uh, the decisions of the Supreme Court, I'm a teacher and I teach constitutional law, and that's mostly Supreme Court decisions. I thought I, I knew about the inside dynamics. Uh, I was wrong about that. <laughs> I, I thought I knew uh, what the uh, dynamic was. As I say, I, I, I didn't fully comprehend the difficulty of the position at the time, time I took it. The, the Supreme Court has these marble steps. Uh, looks like we couldn't have had a Supreme Court and we didn't have Greek architecture. Uh, and, and we look at the Capitol building and then the White House is there and the Washington Monument. And uh, I told some school kids not long ago, I said, Washington's a stage set for democracy. And then the minute I said that, I thought, well, I, I don't want to uh, cheapen the enterprise or use too popular or vacuous uh, a metaphor. So I immediately explained it, but it's real. It's designed to remind you that what you're doing is very important. You are put onto a stage with uh, these props around you to help you realize that what you're doing is, is important and, and does have a significance and does have an obligation and does have a duty and does have an oath connected with it, and you must respect, you must respect your position. As I look back, many of my parents' closest friends were in the government of the state of California, the director of public works, uh, the, the chief counsel for the legislature, the head of the franchise tax board. And these people were very proud to be public servants. And people talk sometimes about the British civil servant, of being absolutely committed people of great integrity. Uh, this is what those people were like in California when I was growing up. And they had this idea of public service. And looking back now, I suppose that was a formative influence on me. At the time you meet someone who is a role model, you don't realize that he or she is a role model, but then you look back and you, you understand what some of the formative influences in your life were. And I think uh, being in the government of the state of California, uh, uh, they had this pride uh, that carried down to me and I'm, I'm very proud to be a government servant. We had a, a very vibrant, active household. My father had a rule that my mother always had to set a couple extra places at the dinner table because people would come from uh, out of the city, from out of the state, to see him and consult him. He was a great attorney. And he would bring them home for dinner because he wanted to be with us. And, and, uh, and we were taught to stay at the dinner table and to participate in the conversation. So, uh, of course, I guess most people thought, who are these? forward obnoxious little children <laughs> but, um, and I, I did not uh, particularly like school and I would run away in the sense I would run home to read so they made up a job for me at the state legislature and I was the only page boy the Senate ever had I was the page boy there for a number of years it probably stunted my growth because of all the cigar smoke they had in, the, in those days I, I as a result knew Earl Warren very well on a somewhat professional basis, professional, it's, it's, I was a nine-year-old page boy and he was the governor. But, um, and of course we knew his children and, and played in the governor's mansion and so forth. But uh, I have a letter I've given at the Supreme Court Historical Society in which he wrote and said, you're gonna go very far in government. And I'm very proud of the fact that I knew well uh, someone who was the Chief Justice of the United States. I read everything that I could get my hands on. My father loved to read Dickens, so we would read that out loud. We would read Shakespeare out loud. Uh, adventure books, uh, they don't read them anymore. 
Howard Pease was a mystery writer for boys. And his hero was a, a, a kid who ran away from home and he became a, a, a mate on, on a ship and had to run. It was called the Tattooed Man. It was a, uh, it was a, a kind of a, a kid's version uh, of um, uh, Herman Melville. <laughs> It may be that I had a certain amount, as all young kids do, of insecurity, and so I wanted to see if I could achieve something specific for that. And um, I was a skinny kid, and uh, so I, I would get, in the summer, I got jobs in the oil fields. My uncle was um, in the oil business, and so at the age of, uh, I think, 14, I got my first job kind of cleaning up around the oil rig, and then I learned how to do that, and I went to Montana, Canada, New Orleans. I worked in a drilling barge on the Gulf uh, in the summer. And the, you could make a lot of money in those, in those days by the standards of those days in the oil fields. And so I saved that to help for my education. And I loved it. I think I maybe learned more in the oil fields than I did in the States. <laughs> and I think there's a lot of wisdom in the working man and the working woman. Uh, I, I think they're very, very concerned with what the country is like, what their life should be like, and I, I think that taught me a lot. Because I was the butt of many jokes when I was a little kid working with these uh, high-powered uh, people in the oil fields, and I, I had to learn to adjust to that and try to pull my own weight. I wanted to be back in California to be uh, near my, my dad, uh, who wasn't well. And I, so I started in San Francisco with a big firm. And then when I lost my dad, I came back up to see if I could start up his practice. And I actually went to close the practice, but it reached out and engulfed me, and I, I never got out. So I started with his solo practice. I wasn't sure I wanted to be a judge. Um, but, uh, some of the people I admired most uh, in the community were judges, and I thought maybe I could best contribute to the law. I love the law. I thought I could best contribute to the law as a judge. I really wanted to be a, a trial judge. You see real people. Uh, you can influence the course of some particular person's life in a way that's more immediate than you can as an appellate judge, uh, which is a writing exercise. If most people could see what an appellate judge does, uh, they would find it very uninteresting. It would be like following the life of a writer. Uh, you don't have the excitement of juries and witnesses. I was teaching uh, this last summer at the School for Judges in Europe, which is in the Netherlands. And their system is different from ours. Uh, in Europe, and most many parts of the world, right out of school you elect one of two paths. You're either a judge or an attorney. And so you're a judge at the very beginning, although you begin as just a clerk for the court, but you work your way up the judge's ladder. So I was teaching a, a class for young judges, and so they were in their late 20s. And a, a lovely woman raised her hand, and she said, how can I be a good judge if I still need to know so much concerning the world around me? And it was one of those questions I wasn't prepared for. Um, and, but everybody was quiet, so it was also one of the defining moments of the class. If you're a classroom teacher, you, you never know. You stumble sometimes on what's a dynamic moment. And I said, and so she asked me, how can I be a good judge if there's so much I still have to learn concerning the world around me? And I said, if you always ask yourself that question, then you will be a good judge. If you realize that your learning doesn't end when you go on the bench, it begins anew, then you'll be a, a good judge. That was the answer I gave her. You, you have to struggle to be neutral. You have to be, struggle to be impartial, which is why the courts have rules. Some people say, oh, these judges are so kind of stuffy. 
They have these traditions, the black robe. and the, This is designed to remind you uh, that your function is greater than you are. You must represent something that's greater than you are, and that's the law, which has a life and a language and a logic of its own. I think um, that maybe the qualities for achievement in my field are not different, much different from those or, uh, than any of the others. There's number one, knowing yourself and being honest about your own failings and your own weakness. Uh, number two, to have uh, an understanding that you have the opportunity to shape the destiny of this country. The framers wanted you to shape the destiny of the country. They didn't want to frame it for you. And you, I think, have to remind yourself that um, you can achieve something now, but that it's going to be measured in the long term. Uh, and I worry about a society in which 5% of the people uses 45% of the nation's resources. I think that's selfish, not only for the rest of the world, but for our, our, for our own grandchildren. And I think you are happiest if you find uh, a profession or a business or an occupation where you manipulate symbols that have an intrinsic ethical content. Tom Wolfe is going to appear uh, at this meeting today. And he wrote a book called Bonfire of the Vanities. It's, a, it's either a parody or a portrayal of New York, probably something, some, some one of both. And he has a uh, a hero who's called protagonist uh, Sher Sher Sherman Sherman McCoy, I think. Or, or, yes, Sherman McCoy. And no one comes out good in this book. The lawyers never do come out very well. Newspaper people don't come out very well. Uh, clergy doesn't come out well. And he's a he's some sort of a businessman. And he goes to the beach with his daughter when she's nine or ten takes the day off and takes her to the beach for her birthday and she looks up and she said daddy what do you do and he realizes and the reader realizes that what he does doesn't make any difference he manipulates symbols with no ethical content and if you're going to achieve you have to achieve by manipulating symbols and working with systems that have an ethical content. I, I would like to begin teaching more students. I've, I've taught many, many students. I, I wish that I could have taught more. I, I wish that I could find a way to reach more young, young people. Uh, the way I do it now is somewhat hit and miss. I teach classes and I go to universities, I, I wish there were some more formal way for me to write or to speak and to try to uh, interest more people in what I think is, is the true dynamic of the law and the true dynamic of freedom. My major concern is that what I thought was the golden age of peace uh, seems farther from our reach than I would have thought up 10 years ago. My major concerns are that there is not an understanding and a commitment to the idea that the American constitutional system and the American idea of freedom has certain universal components that we have the duty, number one, uh, to understand ourselves, and number two, to uh, explain to the rest of the world, not at the point of a baronet, bayonet. That's sometimes necessary, but not at the point of a bayonet. Uh, but because uh, we have a bond with all of humankind. And I don't think that uh, we are looking far ahead enough in this respect. And I am concerned about uh, that, that nationalism, self-interest, uh, will obscure the greatness of American traditions.
I think fiction is very important because it gets us into the mind of a person. Uh, Hamlet is a, uh, a tremendous piece of literature. You know that you know Hamlet better than you know most real people? You know the reason? Because you know what he's thinking. And this teaches you uh, uh, that every human uh, has an integrity and an autonomy and a spirituality of his own, of her own. And l great literature can, t can teach you that. Um, and Billy Budd, Antigone uh, are very important works. And, and Antigone is brilliant. You know, in literature, well, the woman is a symbol of mercy and of equity. Antigone, Portia, Rosa Parks, to use a real person. Uh, that's why Justice is a woman. Uh, even though she has a sword sometimes. I, I, I don't know if that fits. But um, So those Antigone, uh, uh, Merchant of Venice, Hamlet, um, Billy Budd, 1984, you and I were, uh, grew up uh, with great fear of the Soviet military mine, might. And, and 1984 has one of the most brilliant scenes in literature. Uh, the protagonist is being tortured uh, by his communist or uh, totalitarian interrogators. And uh, they want him to say that two and two is five. And finally, he can't stand the torture anymore. He said, okay, two and two is five. But the torture continues. He said, why are you continuing? He said, the torture continues not until you just say it, but until you believe it. And uh, this is a powerful reminder uh, that governments want to plan your destiny. They want to plan what you think. And this must never happen. And so 1984 is a book of tremendous importance, I think, in, 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 that, in that regard. Uh, movies, I think, uh, young people uh, misjudge. If, if you ask high school students um, what are good books, they usually come up with fair answers, the books they get in, what is it, uh, what are the advanced courses, uh, college prep uh, courses in lit, so they use you recite some of those titles. Okay, Scarlet Letter, excellent. Um, Walden Pond, terrible, I think. <laughs> My own choice. I don't like it. Um, but movies, they have no concept that uh, a great movies uh, have an ethical development, uh, a spiritual awareness happens to the character. Uh, movies are just entertainment. And so old, forget it. Subtitles, forget it. Black and white, forget it. Uh, they think of movies as having special effects for momentary entertainment, and, and that's very sad. That's very sad, and, I, and, and I, I think, I'm afraid the producers think of it that way too. Because um, movies are a wonderful way to teach about human struggle, human conflict, human reconciliation, human atonement. I like to think that um, those who were interested in my appointment thought that I was devoted to the law. I like to think that, and that I would be fair. That's, that's all that I ever ask of myself. That's all I ever tried to hold myself out to be. As somebody who's decent and honest and fair and who's absolutely committed to the proposition uh, that freedom uh, is America's gift to the rest of the world.